All righty. Good evening, everyone. I am Lauren Gates, your host of this evening's AOA Health Solutions Conversation Series with our special guest and faculty, Dr. Michael Gelb. Welcome, Michael. It's always good to see you. Thanks, Lauren. It's, always, it's great to be here with you. Thank you. And we actually have 200 people registered tonight, so they might not be all on the call at this time, but they know they can get the recording. So I'm always excited when you guys are so passionate out there to take the time on your Wednesday evening to be with us. So thank you all for joining us. Tonight's topic is really a is such a popular topic all the time in all the forums and all the groups, all the questions I receive um, on a daily basis. It's really about demystifying TMD and how it relates to airway health. So before we dive into this, I know Dr. Gelb has a short presentation just to kind of kick it off with some information for you. And we appreciate your questions that have come in. So we'll get to the questions. And you can also use the Q&A um, located on the bottom of your screen um, to answer your questions live. We'll do our best to answer all of the questions within the hour. I do want to um, just share a disclaimer uh, just to protect you, Dr. Gelb, and Airway Health Solutions. So the views presented are the opinions of our speaker and are not necessarily affiliated with, with Airway Health Solutions. The following webinar is provided for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute providing medical advice or professional services. The information provided should not be used for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease, and those seeking personal medical advice should consult with a licensed physician or dentist just always seek the advice of your doctor or other qualified health provider regarding a medical or dental condition. So the good news is, that Dr. Gell, we have a lot of patients who tune into this. You know, um, really? it's not just, yeah. So that's why I really think it's important um, to just understand that we're not offering advice, but we are excited to share this knowledge so doctors and dentists can provide this type of treatment to their patients. So I know you're um, chomping at the bit here to kick us off. Why don't you go ahead and share your screen? We'll get started and then we'll have a really robust Q&A. Sounds great. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, my experiences, <clears throat> my 38 years doing uh, working with TMJ and then my last 32 years working with airway and I'm not going to talk too much about the ortho because I'm going to tell you about the TMJ. Let me just get into a better view. Sure. Here we go. So the TMJ is really what I call the prequel to airway and ortho. This is how we look like about 8,000 years ago. This is about 2,000 years ago and coming up here is how we look about 300 to 400 years ago. So you see how much skinnier and how much longer our faces have become. But by far, the biggest change happened in the last 400 years. Right. So the, the premise, the premise with ancestral medicine, and if you look at Lieberman's work from Harvard, if you look at Weston Price, if you look at Coraccini, uh, if you look at this is the work of James Nestor, if you understand that we're not dealing with the same skull that we were dealing with three to 400 years ago, it might change the way that you look at uh, this problem in general. This is how we look like about 8,000 years. This woman represents the sort of facial growth that we had about 500 years ago as the centuries passed she starts representing where we are now. This woman represents the sort of facial growth that we had about 500 years ago. As the centuries pass, she starts representing where we are now. This woman represents the sort of facial growth that we had about 500 years ago. As the centuries pass, she starts representing where we are now. So what you're seeing right now is what has happened to uh, the airways in humans. This is why we have sleep apnea. This is why we have crooked teeth. This is why we can't breathe right. The reason we're here tonight is that most of us today, most of the children today do not have room for all 32 teeth. Three to 400 years ago, we had room for all 32 teeth and we had about five or six millimeters behind the third molars. Today, what happens is that most orthodontists wait too long to the child's 10, 11, and 12, they tell the mother, now there's crowding. Of course there's crowding because as 
Ben Moralia says the foundation has gotten smaller. The maxilla is smaller, the mandible smaller. The teeth are crowded because you can't fit 32 teeth. You can't fit 28 teeth into the small maxilla and the small mandible. What does the orthodontist say? Most of them say, a lot of them say, we've got to take out teeth. That's not the right thing to say. So Kevin Boyd's taught us we've got to start early, before age five, before age six. And this just shows you that about 25% of the problem is in the nose, but about 75% of the problem in the obstructed airway occurs behind the maxilla at the level of the soft palate and behind the mandible at the level behind the tongue. So this is something, and we're all airway dentists, we're either moving towards an open airway, every procedure we do either improves the airway or narrows the airway. Unfortunately, a lot of the treatments we're using today in dentistry narrow the airway. And when we looked at the picture of the woman, as our brains got bigger, our mid faces retracted. So our maxilla today, the position of eight and nine is very different than it was 300 years ago. And most of our maxillas are high and narrow. They're narrowed. And that leads to a narrowed, that leads to a narrowed tongue, a narrowed palate. So in other words, if I can show this, so what's happened today, if you look at the- This woman represents the sort of facial- If you look at the skull, that's the old skull. Today's skull is much more narrowed. This woman- Patients don't come in today and say, I have an airway problem. I did have two people in the last two days that had heard a podcast from Andrew Huberman, the neuroscientist from Stanford who talks about the book Breath. After they listened to Huberman and they listened to James Nestor, they came in for a consult with me. Most people don't do that. If they've read the book Breath, they do it. If they've read the book Gasp, they do it. If they read the book Jaws, they do it. Most people, most of our patients are gonna come in with clenching, chronic jaw pain, chronic neck pain, tooth sensitivity, chipping teeth, broken teeth, headaches, neck pain, and then a variety of ear symptoms like tinnitus, ear fullness, and ear pain. That's what our airway patient is coming in with today because most people that come in with these complaints, and like Lane Martin and I talk about, anyone who comes in with clenching, most of those people end up getting a sleep test. When you see these following five things in your practice, tooth wear, and then you can see buttressing of the bone, the maxilla is buttressed. The bone is actually bowed out. You can see the extreme tooth wear. This is a sign of an airway problem in most cases. When you see a crossbite, when you see a narrow maxilla, I used to think TMJ. I learned a long time ago that the side of the crossbite is the more collapsed side. But when I see a case like this, I'm very, very sure that this patient is a mouth breather. I know they can't breathe through the nose because I know they have a narrow maxilla. If they have a narrow maxilla, I know they have a narrowed nose. When I see I have fraction lesions, I'm thinking airway problem. When I see a large scalloped tongue, I'm thinking airway. And lastly, when I see crowding and I see I have fractions and I see those types of flattening lesions, but when I see crowding, I think airway. And so when I now see the arrow between the E and the X, I can never unsee that arrow between the E and the X. And every time I see a wear case, I'm not thinking about how am I gonna restore this case. I'm thinking, why are they clenching? And I'm thinking, I better get a sleep test. I better make sure before I make a device, I better make sure I better see what the diagnosis is. And that's what I'm thinking with crossbite. And that's what I'm thinking with that fraction. And I'm certainly thinking that with the large tongue. You know, in dentistry, my dad used to limp across the floor and it reminds me, so most dentists would want to cut this tongue and make the tongue smaller. 
We don't do that anymore. We make this wider. Most of orthodontics over the last 80 years has been about retraction, and it would be about taking out teeth to make the teeth fit the narrow arch. What we do, what Ben does, what, what people that think like us do is we make the arches wider, as wide as 40 to 42 millimeters in Dr. Moralia's case. Back in 1924, B.B. McCollum, Stuart Stallard, a lot of the nephologists from USC, they were able to start putting study cast on an articulator and they chose the rearmost, uppermost terminal hinge position as being a position that was re repeatable. And they would make dentures and they would make partials and they would make it to that position. Roth and Slavicek, more of a centered position. Frank Salenza years ago found out that the patients didn't want to stay there and he built in a long centric. Bob Ricketts, who's the physiological position, he was actually into airway back in the 50s and 60s. Dawson and Farris said, look, this makes no sense. Rather, Farrer and Gelb said, the terminal hinge makes no sense. They were laughed at, they're still laughed at today. They were heretics. Prostodontists don't really understand what they do. Orthodontists certainly don't understand what they do. Finally, in 1982 or 1985, Dawson changed the definition of centric relation to an anterior superior position. However, most night guards that we see coming in today, 2023, January, most night guards are made in a terminal hinge position. What we do know about terminal hinge is the dentist back at that time had no idea where the disc was. And if you throw the jaw back in this position, you're gonna to lead to more disc displacements and you're gonna to lead to closing the airway. This shows Gelb's 4-7 position, which serendipitous, serendipitously happened to be a good airway position. When I termed the, the, when I termed, uh, the phrase airway centric, it was because, because of my comb beam imaging, I can now visualize the airway starting about 15 years ago. I'm on my fifth comb beam right now using a Vatek. And I like to pull the jaw forward into its physiological position. And I realized that when I brought the jaw forward, alleviated clicking, popping, and locking, TMJ pain, ear symptoms, I was also opening the airway and putting the patient in a more aesthetic position at the same time. I call this win, 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 win. And I love win, win, win. But on top of everything, not only does the patient wake up feeling better, not only do they wake up in a better mood, they actually wake up more attractive in the morning. So if you want to read more about it, the article is Airway Centric TMJ Philosophy. It was in the California Dental Journal. I think this is going back now to 2014. So we've been talking about this for at least eight years, more like 10 to 12 years. Airway trumps TMJ. So what we advocate when we look at the patient, we advocate looking at the airway first, then the TMJ. The last thing we look at is the teeth. I love this model. I think it's from the National Sleep Foundation. This shows the patient how when the jaw goes back, the tongue goes back, when the tongue goes back, it narrows the airway. When you narrow the airway, it interferes with sleep and it can interfere with oxygenation. As I slide the jaw forward, the tongue, which is attached to the genial tubercle, comes forward. The soft palate usually comes forward and we get an airway like a garden hose, which my friend Bill Hang termed. This airway is like a coffee stir. I'll always take the airway that looks like a garden hose. The patient understands this. We put the patient in this position and then we'll, we'll talk about bite changes. If you understood my first three to four slides today about Nestor's work, about Lieberman's work from Harvard, about Coricini's work, we tell the patient in advance that they may get bite changes and we can prevent that with an AM aligner. A lot of patients wanna have bite changes they want to be healthier. And I also said to people, orthodontics has nothing to do with straight teeth. Orthodontics is about brain development. 
Today, we're preventing Alzheimer's, we're preventing dementia. We go a long way to preventing cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and stroke. Part of what we do is we gain a lot of information about the anatomy with our cone beam, CBCT. This being my VATEC, where I get down to C7, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, T1. You can see here that behind the tongue is the airway area of airway narrowing. It gives me a good idea that A point, the maxilla is too far back. We have a nasal labial angle of over 90 degrees. The mandible is too far back. You can see the angulation of the teeth. So this patient needs, if you want to do an appliance first, which I tend to do, but this patient will need orthodontics. 90% of the night guards that come in are made in a retruded or terminal hinge position. This is what we teach in dental school. This is what you would need to pass the boards. If you do everything that you were taught to do in dental school with cuspid guidance, anterior guidance, you're going to tend to make a flat plane appliance. This is what most American dentists do. If you want to prevent tooth wear, it might be okay. But at least 50%, and I would say 90% of these guards actually close the airway. They're not especially good for the TMJ because they're retreating the mandible. And so I would love to see, I would love to do away with this type of guard. Lane and I, if you're going to make a full coverage appliance, think about making it on the lower arch. But again, you really, if you're making a guard because someone's clenching, it really behooves you to take a sleep test first. And if you listen to Jerry Simmons working with Ron Pren, Simmons says the same thing. Most of us that are treating this would say the same thing. I call this the primitive night guard. Primitive because this is soft. It actually encourages clenching. It's dirty. And it tends to close the airway. The other thing we do, I have a secret recipe that I've come up with. And the secret recipe allows me to go from the woman on the right who's tired, she's fatigued. She's got deep lines in her nasolabial folds. She's lost the lower third of her face. She has jaw pain. She has neck pain. And four months later, same woman, we've restored the height. We've given her oxygen at night, and we've given her a recipe of deep sleep, restorative sleep with oxygenation. And she looks like a different person. She's no longer tired. Her focus is better. She's in a better mood. This is what I call the airway promises. And any of you can do the same thing. So wake up refreshed in a better mood. No clicking, no popping, no headaches, no jaw pain. And aesthetically much better. And that's the before, and that's the after. And then if you want to do orthodontics, you do orthodontics. But we are also setting up the final position of the jaw for the orthodontist or for the prosthodontist. These Dr. Bell, there's a question regarding that slide, so it might be easier just to answer it now. It just popped up. <clears throat> it is What is reason nasolabial folds might be prominent and contribute to an aged look? Well, they're not prominent. The nasolabial folds are too deep. So if you look at this, because you've lost height in the lower third of the face, in this particular case, the maxilla is narrowed. What gives the lips their proper look is that the maxilla has to be 38, 40 to 42 millimeters wide. And the anterior teeth, it's the teeth, it's the maxillary expansion that fills out the lips and gets rid of the nasolabial fold. So if you look at the less fold, less wrinkles, because I've lengthened the mandible by four, five, six millimeters, 
<laughs> that's what gives me the bigger lips. This is not filler that's doing this. This is your appliance therapy. And then after that, it will be your orthodontics that does this. So the change in the face occurs over three to four months with oxygenation and deep restorative sleep. There's a lot that happens with the restoration. Then she goes back to that older look. You can see they're graying, the skin tone changes. She's pale, she's gray, she's under oxygenated. Now she's looking better. Her skin is glowing, her eyes are opening up. She's got full lips and now she ages again. Another case, and as we restore the height of the face, we can do Botox. We're bringing in those large masseters. Now she has no lips. It's a much tougher look. She looks like a tough woman. And as she lengthens, the lips come back, the eyes open, the look softens. And now she goes back to someone who's had her upper two bicuspids extracted. She's in pain, she's tired, she's clenching all night. And now we come to her younger version. So those are my slides. Um, and I can open it up for um, any questions that we have. I, I didn't want to right. show appliances, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. How did I do it? Um, what am I trying to do? Mm -hmm. This might be a new concept for some of you, but we basically use a lower appliance for the day and we use a combination of an upper appliance with the ramp with a lower uh, punch out or Invisalign tray at night. And, uh, you know, during the course that we teach, we do a one day course on TMJ leading into um, airway, and then that leads into orthodontics. So this really sets you up. This, the, the goal of this treatment, first of all, most TMJ patients have an airway problem. The signs and symptoms, a lot of them are from the FedEx slide that I showed. But a lot of these people, if you really look carefully, they have headaches, they have clicking jaws, they're breaking teeth, they're clenching. A lot of them have ear symptoms. They have ear fullness, they have ringing of the ears. If you look at the medical history, a lot of these people also have reflux, they have high blood pressure. And there are things in the medical history, arrhythmias, um, that will really clue you into the fact that they probably have an airway. And then the last thing this does, by working with the TMJ for two to three months, it tells you exactly where to finish the case. It gives you an architectural blueprint as to where to finish the case um, three-dimensionally and architecturally. What if someone has a military straight neck that is contributing to a narrow airway? Well, a lot of what happens is a lot of things that we, that we have in here are compensations. So a lot of patients will go into a forward head posture. A lot of, almost every woman I see has a dowager's hump. Almost every woman I see has a dowager's hump. And so the neck posture will change because the patient is concerned with living through the next minute, through the next three minutes. The patient wants to get through the day. And by doing that forward head posture, that's the compensation. We also know that a lot of TMJ patients are mouth breathers. The mouth breather le leads to vertical growth. I was a mouth breather. It also leads to a retronathic mandible. It also leads to a large gonial angle. So as you become a mouth breather, your maxilla comes down and back. You get a bump on the nose, you get a gummy smile, and you get a retruded or retronathic mandible. So this problem starts when you're one, two, three years of age. Your growth pattern is established by how you breathe as a child. 
So the same thing that gives you the growth, the vertical growth, the adenoid facies, the long face syndrome, that starts very early. And that leads to both airway issues because the way you breathe, if you got rid of all the airway issues when the child was small, they would never have TMJ issues. You can, no. you can prevent TMJ. You can prevent someone from having TMJ. So it starts at a very, 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 early, very early age. Can I show you the dentition, how the teeth look different between the start and finish for both cases? I could, but I'm not. So um, you can take my course and I can show you the teeth. But basically, I'm going to tell you right now that all these patients have a deep bite. The mandible is back. The maxilla is back. Remember, the maxilla is retruded in 80 two percent to 85 percent of all cases the maxilla is too far back remember the maxilla has been the mid face has been retracting over the last 300 years so if the maxilla is too far back that's why when people talk to me about bite changes the typical they don't get it people most dentists do not get it if the maxilla is in the wrong place don't tell me about bite changes because i want bite changes a lot of the time you want the maxilla to be protracted. A lot of these cases are class two dip two. So in terms of bite changes, we can avoid bite changes by using an AM aligner. Um, let's see. Yeah, Did so I, I have a lot of questions from people that typed in when they registered. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. but um, I, I do want to address Nicole. She has a great, um, uh, she's sharing a comment with us is the frustration with learning about all these possible treatments by gurus such as yourself, Dr. Gelb, is as an independent RDH and OMT, she has nowhere to send her clients for similar care. And, you know, I, it's, it's kind of like gut wrenching when I hear this, because, you know, we're trying to create this airway health movement where it's really up to our profession to spread the word to other dental professionals to to learn this, <laughs> you know, this is what we're trying to do. If um, if you go to our website, airwayhealthsolutions.com forward slash locator, you can see we have close to 400 airway dentists, but it's certainly not covering the map, but people do travel. I know Dr. Gell, people do travel to see you, correct? They travel all the time to see me. And uh, sometimes that's what you have to do. Look, you want to establish a local group we're having a meeting here on March 2nd, speech language pathologists, myofunctional therapists, pediatric ENTs, oral surgeons, orthodontists, pediatric dentists, occupational therapists, physical therapists. You know, I, I'm lucky, I work with Brad Gilden. I work with all his fellows. I work with airway-centric physical therapists. And I'm lucky that I have that opportunity to work with PRI physical therapist, Postural Restoration Institute. So yeah, you've got to make your own team. You've got to encourage your dentist in your area to go and get trained in this because this training does not occur in dental school. And I, I was, I'm shocked to learn even that breastfeeding is controversial today, but it is. I think people are in the pocket of the formula companies maybe, but breastfeeding somehow is controversial. Um, treating tongue tie is controversial, very controversial. So you've got a lot of people that want to follow evidence-based treatment, but there's also practice-based evidence. Um, it seems to me that opening the airway is a good thing. Um, airway is how we've progressed. We don't fight about TMJ. We don't fight about condylar position. Any one of my colleagues from Dawson, Whit, Whit Wilkerson and I are good friends, Mark Murphy and I are good friends, Steve Carstensen, anyone who believes in opening the airway is a friend of mine. And anyone who's clothing, closing the airway, I will come after you and you will get sued and you should lose your license. So no one should close the airway um, after you hear this lecture today. So if you're making night guards in terminal hinge, you should probably stop there are some people that need to be there, maybe people that have systemic joint laxity, people that have uh, uh, subluxations, dislocations, I get that. But by and large, we don't want to be shoving the jaw back at night. What other questions do you have, Laura? Um, so you just brought up the March 2nd meeting. I know you're doing that locally in New York. Is that something that um, I can help 
um, spread the word once you get the information I can send out to people in New York area? Well, we want, to keep only? It, we want to keep it invite only. Okay. Of course, Lauren, you're invited. Um, it's kind of our New York City group, but, yep. you know, we'd like to get, you know, Scott Province and I are putting it together uh, with Luke Shapiro and some like-minded people. But certainly if you're interested, you're always invited, Lauren, you know that. Thank, thank you. But um, I think maybe we can discuss, maybe we could even um, live stream it just to, or record it just to spread the word a little I bit. Would, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love that. And if yeah. you, you know, because Scott and I are putting it together with Luke and we're going to do it down at Luke's place. Um, mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Okay. Great idea. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you can get it to all your, it would, could be a model for what people are doing or can do around the country. Yeah, that's, you know, it all starts with an idea. So uh, yeah. thanks for asking about that. Cause um, you know, it's just too, there's too much information uh, out there not to share and um, everyone needs to hear it. So whoever's on this meeting tonight, you're a, a thought leader, you know, or else you wouldn't be here tonight. You're a change maker. So, um, so we really do appreciate you being part of our airway health movement. Um, at what age does the lower jaw and TMJ stop remodeling? It's a great question. So remember that most of your patients are, it's going to occur in women after puberty. So you only start to see these TMJ patients at 12, 13, and 14. So these girls only start to come in because before, before puberty, no one's complaining about TMJ. It's very rare, but after the estrogen starts to come in, proliferate, after the patient, as the patient's going through puberty, and I can't blame the orthodontist for every case because the reason this is most prominent in women is because of estrogen. So boys with the same bite do not get the same symptoms because they don't have estrogen receptors. So when someone says, what age do you stop remodeling? The TMJ is a very reparative joint. The TMJ is made out of fibrocartilage. So people can heal in their 30s, they can heal in their 40s, they can heal in their 50s. In terms of growth and development and when's the mandible, well, boys come after girls, girls finish, but we're so stuck in the dogma in dentistry. People are still telling me, I heard it tonight. Well, you can't expand the maxilla. You know, that's what we learned in dental school. And I was still hearing that I graduated Columbia in 1982. And like Bill, Bill Hanks says, and Ben Moralia says, if Ben is doing it, it can be done. We're doing it all the time. Is it easier to do it in women than in men? Yeah, it's easier to expand the maxilla. Um, so we, we're, I wanna hear, I always hear from the naysayers why it can't be done, but the God's honest truth is it's being done all over, all over America. Um, you just have to look at the pockets for people that know what they're doing and are showing that it can, it can be done. So I wouldn't worry about what age I can't. I, I treat up to the, the 80s. So if you want to learn about remodeling, I think you can get remodeling as long as there's fiber cartilage. And certainly there's a huge growth area. And probably next year, Lauren, you know, we'll be teaching more about uh, platelet PRP injections, stem cell injections, amniotic fluid injections, and really using regenerative medicine. At, we're going to keep talking about regenerative medicine more and more and more. And I have Dr. Santano's group, Regenerex, uh, a spina is in my building at 635 Madison. I'm sending more and more people for injections to regenerate the tissue and the joint to heal it as opposed to surgery these days. Very interesting. Um, what can Mayo only do for a TMD client if ortho or surgery is not in their budget? Would you want posture addressed before surgery if that was the case? Well, we don't do surgery, so let's yeah. let's not talk about surgery. So, I mean, I had a case in today that it had uh, orthognathic surgery, and she happened to have been an idiopathic condyle resorption case where she had totally lost her condyles and now has an anterior open bite. So, I think in the rare case, you know, we have to be aware of these open bites or these these rare cases where the joint keeps degenerating. 
but that's not the typical case. Um, in terms of myofunctional therapy, I think if you can keep a child, if you can keep a child, teach a child to put their tongue, if you can teach a child proper rest oral posture, my face would have grown much more horizontally. If I was taught to be a nose breather when I was two and I was three, and I was taught where to put my tongue, and I was taught how my tongue should function, my face would have grown totally differently and I would have had many less TMJ symptoms. So the answer is the earlier you start the myo, the earlier you train the patient to be a nasal breather, the earlier you establish neuroplasticity with the proper swallow, the proper tongue posture, that will set you up also for better breathing, diaphragmatic breathing. You can teach the kid any of these breathing techniques that you want, but that's going to establish posture. And as you're seeing this mouth breathing, this long face posture, you're also seeing changes in the posture of the neck, the posture of the low back, because everything becomes a compensation and breathing is a major part of that compensation. But you're going to see postural issues because of the problem in the breathing the tongue posture and the swallow at a very, very early age, we can pick that up. It's being missed a lot right now. And the patient is not getting to the myofunctional therapist early enough. A lot of the children that have feeding issues also will have tongue and swallowing and speech issues. Right now, we have an arbitrary designation that between birth and age two, everything goes to the occupational therapist. Then when the kids can speak and they have speech issues, then the SLP, the speech language pathologist gets involved. A lot of speech language pathologists don't have any idea what an airway is. Most of them mm -hmm. don't have a clue. So now you have all these, all these speech language pathologists working in these schools, all the kids get evaluated for pre-K and K. The kids have speech issues. Some of them have tongue tie. Some of them have a narrowed palate. There's no room for the tongue, but it's picked up a little bit late. And so the educational system has to change. There has to be more overlap between OP, OTs and SLPs. And the SLPs have to learn something about swallowing airway and rest oral posture. So there's still so, we're still so early in this. And mm -hmm. we always talk at AAPMD, Lauren, we want all the specialists to, to, to work together. And I, I don't know about the Practice Act. Red and I were talking about what is possible for speech language pathologists. I would like, as Brad's becoming more of a myofunctional therapist and working with the tongue, I want the speech language pathologist to become more like Brad and to do start doing some functional manual therapy, Lauren, on the tongue. I want the speech language pathologist to learn manual therapy. So I think we have to learn from each other. We have to share. That's why when we have these meetings and people start talking, and we put on some gloves and I have my Brad showing the SLP how to manipulate the tongue and how to break up adhesions and how yeah. to work with fascia. That's where we're gonna make advances. Like who says that you can't treat this? Who says? These are arb arbitrary designations a lot of the time. And save the date, that's September 7th through the 9th in Orlando, the AAPMD meeting. Um, that's a great meeting to really um, make sure that you attend to collaborate and learn from, from everybody. Um, there's just a comment here about from an SLP that some SLPs do, but yes, unfortunately, nothing is taught in the grad school about airway. We certainly have a lot of, of ground to cover. If somebody traveled to see you, Dr. Gell, for treatment, how many appointments approximately would it take? Well, you know, we evaluate, I do everything on the first visit. So we evaluate, you know, as we do more with digital and as we have start to have printers, 3D printers in our offices, but we can get an appliance back within a day to two days. I usually like someone to stay around then maybe three or four days because I want them to wear it overnight before they go back. I want to do an adjustment on the appliance to make sure it's comfortable. Very often I'll have a daytime, a lower for the day, and I'll have an upper and lower combo at night. 
So I want them to try the day appliance. I want to make sure they can speak fairly well with it. I want to make sure there's no, you know, sharp edges or nothing is irritating the, the tongue or the teeth. So I usually like if look, three would be three is okay, four is better. Um, but we can usually, you know, we used to have technicians right in our office. We would make a lot of appliances the same day. I used to have David and Wally in my office. I would do same day inserts. So that's how I started my career. We've always been lucky, but we're going to come full circle. And now we'll be able to 3D print probably within one to two years. Some people are doing it now, but those are mostly the flat plane appliances as we get more sophisticated. Um, and I think I'll do something with Jeff Shapiro out at the uh, uh, Society for Dental Aesthetics down in Sarasota. Uh, you like that area, Lauren. I probably, you yeah. like to come yep. down there. So <laughs> we're probably going to do a workshop with 3D printing where we'll show you how to do it right then and there. Um, Jeff has a big ortho lab. So Lauren, when you come down there, he's got basically the whole floor. He's got a huge ortho lab. He's got a huge dental dental lab, and he's got a huge teaching space down there. So I think the trend is going towards 3D printing. Um, mm -hmm. I like that approach. And I think it's that's probably the future. Okay. Um, what are some options for children with special needs? I was going to say send them over to Kevin. Or... Well, I think you have to be trained. You know, we'll, we'll see, we'll treat anybody. But you got to understand kids on the spectrum, most kids on the spectrum have behavioral sleep issues. They have insomnia. And what I used to say to my, my girlfriend, uh, Christy, you really have to get to take care of the sleep issues, the nutritional issues, and exercise. So you really see what you have there. Like we talk about uh, finding Connor Deegan, Lauren. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, when, you, when someone gets diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder or they get diagnosed with ADHD, I want to make sure that we've, we've addressed all the sleep issues, all the breathing issues, the kids getting good exercise, they have myofunctional therapy, they've had their tonsils and adenoids if necessary removed. Let's see what kind of kid we're left. I know we can get 50% of the kids with ADHD off of medications, special needs, Down syndrome. Again, you know, these kids are going to do better if we make more room for the tongue. Um, so I want to give them every advantage we can give any other kid, um, but I want to take the sleep issues off the table, and then I want to see who am I left with? Like, who's this kid really? You know, a lot of people get mislabeled sometimes with different ones, and I'm not saying this is true for Downs, but I'm saying for ADD, oppositional defiant disorder, very often we, we rush to judge what we really what really is going on. Yeah, um, we're going to provide the links uh, for Dr. Gelb's course and the dates in just a minute when the questions are over. But I can say it's March 31st. It's a full day course and it is held uh, virtually uh, via Zoom. Uh, it's a very interactive course. I know it's almost like uh, it's like having Dr. Gelb in your living room. <laughs> it's very, very uh, interactive. It's real time. So we'll send you all the information and we'll go over that in just a moment when I kind of give you some updates to our other courses courses as well. Um, is there a safe, um, oh, what is the safe amount when we have to increase the vertical to gain space to fabricate an oral appliance? Four millimeters or how about for our TMD patients? Well, let me answer Michelle's entire question, okay? So the reason, the most valuable real estate in your mouth, Michelle, the most valuable real estate in your entire mouth, like Madison Avenue, Fifth Avenue, Rodeo Drive, multi, multi Napoleani in Milan, the lingual of the upper, the lingual of the upper arch. So if you're going to make a guard and you make it too thick, you will narrow the airway. So it's usually safer to make a lower appliance. It's less gaggy. It doesn't impinge upon the airway as much as an upper. So you want to keep the appliance as thin. If you're going to make an upper, it's got to be super thin on the lingual. That's very important. In terms of vertical, if you have someone like me that already has a long face, you really can increase the vertical a lot. You want to make sure the patient can have a lip seal at night. 
Someone who's lost height in the lower third of the face, like the cases I showed you, you can give them two, three, four millimeters of vertical. Sometimes you can give them five or six and they look fantastic. So I want you to use aesthetics. These people have lost freeway space. They're overclosed. So if I have a deep bite like this, well, I can open them up like that. So if I have someone who has a long face like me, I don't want to open that. But if I have someone who's lost height in the lower third of the face, I can open that up. I can open that patient up and I can easily go three. And you know, what we learned from treating airway, some people like three millimeters is the standard for like prosomnus with the bite fork. But some people that don't get better at three will get better at four or five. We've known that for 32 years. So vertical height can heal like Ben Pereira used to say, but adding that extra one to two millimeters, Michelle, um, can really make a big difference. So I hope that answered your question. Great. And then why would you recommend the lower night guard versus the upper? Because the tongue can still go freely and sit forward on the upper arch. If I make an upper night guard and I over contour it behind eight and nine, I'm going to push the tongue back and I'm inadvertently, I'm closing the airway. So if to be safe, you want to make a lot more lower guards than upper, but a lot of times that you're going to make a combo upper and lower, but 3D printing has allowed us to keep the material much thinner because of the resiliency. Acrylic, you can't do, you can't do as much with because of the PMMA, because the quality of the acrylic is more brittle and you can't get it that thin. Hope that helps. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know. In the same vein as leading off of that question, what happens with CUD people? Do you know what that means? No, but I'm going to look at the question if I can. Okay, yeah, it's the Nicole. Question. The acronym. Um, I, I don't, don't know. know. CUD, Nicole, tell us what CUD yeah. is. Yeah, <laughs> let's see. Oh, full upper denture. <laughs> oh, complete upper denture? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So most of the time with the complete upper denture, the arches have already atrophied. So the maxilla is back. 90% of the time in a denture case. So you're really better off in those cases to do over dentures or to do implants because, well, okay, right off the bat, ready? Right off the bat, you keep the dentures in at night, you cut the apnea by 50%. You keep the dentures in at night and you cut the apnea by 50%. Just opening vertical on a case like that will cut the apnea. And then if you put a, you don't want to attach the upper and lower uh, appliances. So you can put a sleep appliance on an upper denture and a lower denture and just do something like a dorsal and it won't, it won't dislodge the denture. So ideally though, those are difficult cases. A lot of the denture patients have lost vertical and most of the time the maxilla has both uh, Atrophy, the maxilla has gone back anteriorly, posteriorly, and it's usually narrowed. Okay. What percentage of TMD cases are related to airway issues? Well, I would say at least 50%. When I talk to my, my friend, Lane Martin, he says 65, but some people would even say up to 80%. So I think most TMJ cases, most TMJ cases, also have an airway component. Now, when you're dealing with, remember, the two, I only told you about the girls after puberty, the other big class of patient that you're going to see, your perimenopausal women, 50% of my practice is 49, 50, and 51. That's also the same age where the genioglossus receptors in the tongue become less effective. It's also the same age where women start to put on fat in their neck and in their bellies. Women used to put on weight in their rear ends and their thighs, but as they get into menopause, they start to get a male pattern of weight gain, which happens to be like us, like a beer belly, and they start to put on weight in their necks. That predisposes them to get sleep apnea. So 
if you say to me, I'm going to tell you that most perimenopausal women are not sleeping well. They have insomnia. They have night sweats. But they also have undiagnosed upper airway resistance syndrome. And they can have sleep apnea. So it's okay. almost going to be an overlap, Lauren. I'd say 75 to 80% of perimenopausal women. But I'd say in general, at least 50% to 65% of TMJ patients have an airway problem. Okay. A lot of these questions that are asked are technical um, questions, like very technical, which we really can't give a quick answer to. That's why we built uh, the course. So I do want to share with everyone um, our, our upcoming events. But do you want to look at that question from Dr. Ping Zong? I see it. I see it. Yeah, go ahead. And I'll share my screen while... While so the that. answer is the answer is that as Ben Moralia teaches in his course, as Ben Moralia teaches, as he expands with either an expander or Invisalign, he makes more room for the tongue. And if he in, in many cases, as he expands, the tongue will open up, the nose will open up, the nose will open up, and you will actually get an improvement in nasal breathing following palatal expansion. Okay. I'm going to do the slideshow here. And then what is the cost? I know it's very difficult for you to, um, you know, kind of go into in a general, can you give a, a range of costs perhaps in like in New York, in New York City for these cases? Yeah, so I think, you know, I don't think you want to charge any less than you know, 15, 16, 1700 for a night guard. I mean, we do 3000 and maybe 3000. We charge for our day guard and we charge for our night guard. And then it's more for an FDA approved sleep device, at least 3,500. Those are the approximate costs, but you've got to value what you do. You're really transforming someone's life. Okay, absolutely. And that's, you know, that doesn't include the ortho or whatnot. That's just the TMD Correct. portion. Correct. Okay. So let's talk about your mini residency. I, I love this course. This is such a great addition because it, again, it's part of the airway health solutions is addressing the TMD. In fact, one of the questions was that it really wasn't a question. It was just more of a comment. Um, Dr. Orcutt shared that uh, he said, I'm beginning the journey to treat airways and TMD is one of the limiting factors but it doesn't have to be, right? It can be, it kind of is all, all together. You want to just comment on that comment and how you can break those barriers? Say, just say it slowly one more time. Sure. It's basically someone was sharing that. It says, I am beginning the journey to treat airways and TMD is one of my limiting factors. It well, wasn't a question. It was just a comment. Well, we heard that. Remember we heard that from our friend that took our, airway palooza course, mm -hmm. sometimes TMJ is the piece that puts it all together. So I describe myself as the architect. I'm three-dimensionally positioning, positioning the mandible and I'm testing it in order to make the airway treatment more successful, but also as a blueprint for where you're gonna finish the case eventually. So I'd say the TMJ is a vital component because many people are going to present to your office with TMJ complaints and not come in initially and say and shout out to you that they're an airway case. So I yeah, think, and, that, yeah. But we developed this course because you work with um, Dr. Moralia closely and now um, Dr. Jeremy Montrose, but you work hand in hand. It's not... TMD or ortho, it's like <laughs> peanut butter and jelly. Right? They go a, hand in hand. It's a continuum. It's a continuum. They work together. Um, and you really need to know about how to deal with clicking and popping and locking. And we deal with cants. We deal with asymmetries. We analyze ramus height on the right and the left. And we we, we, we look at early childhood injuries and we see how trauma impacted the jaws and, and, and it really gives you a better appreciation of the case, you know, from the bottom up. You know, I think I know that airway trumps TMJ,
but sometimes TMJ is really the entry. It's really the entry point for getting into airway and orthodontics. So I it's think- It's part you, of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. It's part of the puzzle. And sometimes they'll make the movie, but then they'll go back and, and make the prequel. So if you wanna know how it got there, if you wanna know where you can start, I like starting at the beginning. I like starting a lot of cases with the TMJ because I can't really go to ortho. If someone's in pain, if someone has jaw pain, if someone has a headache, I need to get rid of that first. And you have to know what to do if you're treating orthodontically or treating the airway, and then someone develops a TMJ complaint, you better know how to treat it. Well, or whether I teach you to do Botox or I teach you how to do an appliance adjustment, you have to know the biomechanics of a class three lever system. You have to know how, where the bite point is, how that affects muscle force. And I think it's just good to know the basics of the biomechanics of the jaw, of the bite, how the muscles come to play and how the joint interacts with the muscles, interacts with the tongue, interacts with the airway um, and that how that interacts with the occlusion. So I think it's a great, I think I'm great at talking about occlusion. I think I know a lot about occlusion. I think it's not gonna be the dogma that you learned in dental school. I'm not gonna talk about balancing interferences. I'm not gonna talk about working interferences. I'm not gonna talk about Bennett shifts, but I'm gonna to talk to you a lot about where the maxilla, the maxillary teeth should be, where the mandibular teeth should be. I'm gonna to talk to you about if the bite's hitting too hard in the back, or if it's even hitting too hard in the front and where the bite force should be. And then someone at the end of your course, what is your goal for them at, you know, for the next day or Monday morning? A lot of these TMJ patients are sitting in your chair right now. So at least 50% of the people in your hygiene chair tomorrow have TMJ and airway problems. So 25% of all the women that come in tomorrow are gonna to have chronic tension, headaches, and neck pain. You're probably gonna miss it. And then 50% of the people that are in your hygiene program have airway problems. But it's gonna be much easier for you to see the TMJ. You're gonna see the wear. You're gonna see crossbite cases. You're gonna see abfraction cases tomorrow. And you're gonna to see scalloped tongues tomorrow. And you're gonna to see crowding tomorrow. And when you see the crowding tomorrow, if you see a narrow maxilla, if you see black buckle cardus, if you see a high vaulted palate, that patient has an airway problem. So my goal is, first of all, you gotta start recognizing it. Remember only 15% of these patients have been diagnosed. So I want you to recognize the problem. That's the most important thing. And then really then know how to sequence the treatment. Um, and I'd like you to start with TMJ if you can. Absolutely. So we also have our mini residencies uh, with Dr. Ben Moralia. And I know Dr. Gelb, you work really closely with Dr. Moralia. We do, we did make an extra pediatric mini residency due to popular demand January 20th. So we do have a couple of seats left, I believe, for that. Um, if you can register by tomorrow, that would be wonderful. Uh, but we do have a couple coming up in February, April, and June. Um, so that'll teach you the baseline of airway integration for children and adults. I'm happy to discuss more about that in detail. If you want to reach out to me, I'm always accessible for a phone call. Uh, we do have our myofunctional therapy course um, for the private practice OMT or for dental hygienists who want to learn how to integrate this into their dental practice. And we also have um, a six-week private practice myo for those currently practicing. We do have a flash sale of $200 off. These links are here, but I will send them up in your follow-up email. Um, Brittany and Carice, they're a wonderful duo and they share their experience of having the two two instructors with two opinions that that really blend nicely. It's a really, really comprehensive course and you'll be able to integrate myofunctional therapy under your scope of practice. We do have our, our uh, advanced mini residency coming up in Florida. Uh, Michael, are you going to be down in Florida the 27th, 28th? Uh, yeah, I will be. 
yeah, come on by, come on by. And say All right. hello. Thank yeah, you. definitely. I know we haven't, we kind of been playing telephone tag here. So um, I know Dr. Mariah will be, will be there. Dr. Gallup will be there now. Uh, but Dr. Boyd has really um, been doing this for 30 years, treating children under five years old with fixed and removable expansion. He has his own techniques. It's a cookbook of how he does what he does. He provides tons of research, science, everything to back it up. He will show you how to do PowerPoint um, presentations for patient, uh, for parent presentation and patient acceptance. It's really a wonderful course. This is our second one. So we're really excited about that. It will be live streamed as well and it will be recorded. So reach out to me if I know it's coming up soon. If you can't make it or you'd want to learn this, but perhaps want to on demand. We are pretty flexible that way. So we try to make it accessible to anybody who wants to learn. So just set up a phone call with me if that sounds interesting to you. Our advanced course with Dr. Morelia is really, it's kind of an extension of the mini residency, if you would. It's just, we can't, we can only do so much at one time. So these two days will really cover um, fixed expansion in older children and teens, and then the um, fixed bracket wire techniques using an expansive orthodontic te techniques with the SLX carrier system. So you can learn more at our website as well. I don't know if there's any orthodontists listening, airway focus, but we would love to spread the word to the orthodontic community. So everyone on this call, if you want to share with your orthodontist that we have a peer-to-peer -peer mini residency, orthodontist to orthodontist, that'll be um, debuting May 5th with Dr. Brett Christensen, uh, who has been on these conversations before. So you can listen to the archives for free. Um, there's no charge for that, but he's been doing this for over 30 years, has a wealth of information and has treated thousands, thousands of children. Uh, people always ask me how I find one of these airway dentists. Please go to our airwayhealthsolutions.com locator. It's a good first step. At least you know they have the expansive airway health philosophy uh, and they can guide you maybe to providers um, who specifically work with TMD or perhaps they'll become a TMD uh, specialist themselves. Uh, we're global, which we're also thankful for. We do have our own airway aligners, which is accessible to our uh, alumni. So once you take our course, um, we give you access to our airway aligners through Ollendorf Appliance Lab, where the expansive protocols are already built in through Dr. Moralia's algorithm. So that's really exciting. Uh, I know Dr. Gell just stepped away for a moment, but we have um, our lab with Kevin Ollendorf. Everyone's asking where they can order these appliance for appliances from. Dr. Gelb has partnered with um, Kevin to have these specific appliances made with his uh, preferences. So you can reach out to Kevin Ollendorf. But again, this is not, it's just not about the appliance. It's about learning the course, the technique. That's why we built a course. So uh, we hope that you will go ahead and get educated and join us March 31st. Um, anyone can become part of our Airway Dentist Facebook group uh, once you take our courses. And then we have our open public group um, Airway Health Meetup. So again, this will be in your follow-up email. Please spread this to your colleagues because the more people who learn, the more people can get treated. And that's really the bottom line. We have uh, another Airway Health Solutions conversation coming up next week, a town hall with Brittany and Carice, anything about Mayo. Um, I know Dr. Gelb's a huge fan of myofunctional therapy. I believe your mother was a myofunctional therapist, right? And then, yeah, your daughter is at SLP. So um, please yes. uh, join us for that. They'll, that'll be an informative course. We have Dr. Shireen Lim on February um, 8th. She'll be talking about her Breathe, Sleep, and Thrive book and how she um, has really cornered the, the airway uh, industry in her neck of the woods. And then Dr. Reza uh, Movahead is doing the MMA surgery. We're going to see wonderful, wonderful case reviews. So um, save save those dates. These are all free. If you guys come, we will still continue to build them. We did partner with Nearman Practice Management. So again, I'll send this in the follow-up. I know you can get a lot of these TMD treatments um, re reimbursed through medical billing. So I know Dr. Gelb was very successful doing that. He actually shares some of those uh, techniques in his course, um, but he really refers to third parties. Uh, like Nearman Practice Management. So again, we partnered with them because they're part of the solution. We wanted you to get reimbursed so you can get better case acceptance. 
So that's all I have. I know another benefit to um, becoming an uh, alumnus is we have our quarterly town halls, which we're going to jump over to now. So for all our alumni, you can join us and have that private session with Dr. Gelb. Um, it's 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 going to be via Zoom with camera, so it's a little bit more intimate. But I think these town halls are priceless and help with the follow up of the community building and fellowship that we have built here. So I'm going to sign off with this group for now. Dr. Gelb, I'll see you on the town hall with a separate link. All of the alumni, uh, check your email or check the Facebook private group for the link uh, to our town hall for our intimate conversation. And everyone, again, thanks for your passion and uh, being part of our airway health movement. We'll see you uh, soon. Thanks again. Thanks, thanks Dr. Gelb, Thank for you all your very help. Much. Okay. Thank you. Bye.